Uh, if you've chosen to join us online today, whether you're joining us live or you're joining us later, we welcome you to worship at Golden Corner Church. The first four books of the New Testament tell us that on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus met together with his 12 disciples. As a part of the Passover celebration, they shared a meal together. After the meal, Jesus took a piece of bread and he gave thanks for it. And he broke it and he gave each man at the table a piece of bread. Then he explained, I want this bread to symbolize my body, which is going to be broken for you. Of course, he was referring to his suffering and his imminent death. At his command, each man ate the bread. Then Jesus filled a cup with wine, gave thanks for it, passed it around the table. Then he explained that this wine symbolizes my blood, which will soon be shed to purchase your forgiveness and salvation. At his command, each man drank from the cup. In the New Testament of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, to be specific, we learn from the Apostle Paul that Jesus wanted all believers to continue doing what he and the disciples did on that night before his death. We call it communion or the Lord's Supper. And in just a moment, we're going to take communion together. But before we do, let's answer this question. Why? Why do you suppose Jesus wants us to continue the practice of communion? Let me share three answers. Answer number one, communion jogs our memory. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul was clear about why Jesus wants us to continue observing communion. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. We observe communion as a reminder that Jesus died and shed his blood for us. Uh, you see, we human beings, we're forgetful. I, I read through the Old Testament this year, and, and i got to be honest with you, I was shocked at times at how forgetful the Israelites were. They constantly forgot God and all that he had done for them, and as a result, they often took God for granted. However, forgetfulness is not just a characteristic of the Jewish race. It's also a characteristic of the human race. So Jesus wants us to continue participating in the Lord's Supper so that we never forget that he suffered and died for us. We're not to forget what Jesus did nor the reason why he did it. He loves us. And greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Reason number two, communion shares Jesus with others. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul also tells us that when we share communion, we are actually sharing the good news about Christ with others. Have you ever thought about that? When we take communion together, we are announcing the love, the death, and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We are today showing others the true way back to God. Reason number three. Communion reminds us of a promise. On a night that was intended to be a celebration, Jesus bombarded the disciples with bad news. He informed them, one of you is going to betray me. Uh, a fellow by the name of Judas Iscariot. And once Jesus shared this, Judas got up and left the room and he went out so that he could set the crucifixion in motion. Jesus, 
and you know, guys, if you've ever read much about what happened that night, the, this, the sequence of events can be confusing, but it appears to me that when Judas left the room, that's when Jesus had communion with the 11 remaining disciples. He explained to them the bread and the wine symbolized my suffering and death. Then he dropped a real bomb on them. He told them that he was leaving. And I'm sure that as they heard that, they must have reasoned to himself, well, that's probably the best thing he could do. Probably a wise move on his part because the religious community is really ramping up the pressure on him. There's no telling what they're going to do to him. But Jesus clarified what he meant. He was going to leave this earth. And he was going back to be with the Father. He was leaving them, and to make matters worse, they couldn't go with him. Not yet. As you can imagine, this news devastated the disciples. Now, with all this in mind, I want you to read a verse with me, because it appears to me that at this point in the evening, Jesus has already communicated to them, guys, this is what the bread and wine represents, and, and uh, I want you to continue, even after I'm gone, I want you to continue doing this. And then he made him a promise. And I want you to look what he said. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. He said, mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you. You see those two words? Mark my words. He said, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It's very important that you notice those two words, with you. Jesus promised them that he wouldn't participate in this meal again until they were all reunited with him. Jesus just made these men a big, big promise. However, he made it in such a way that was so subtle, I'm not sure that these men caught it. So later in the conversation, Jesus made himself crystal clear John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, Jesus said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Boy, you got to see this. When everything is ready. When everything is ready. Here's the promise. I will come. And get you. So that you will always be with me. Where I am. Jesus just told these men that this life isn't all there is. He told them that this was not the final chapter of their story. And assured them that their story would end on a positive note. Jesus promised these men eternity with him. And I believe Jesus wanted these men to keep observing communion as a means of constantly reminding them of this promise that he had made to them. And now let's turn our attention. Let me turn my attention to you. I believe Jesus wanted you here today. I believe he wanted you to be watching. I I believe he wants us to observe communion today so that he can remind you that there are better days ahead. No matter what the current chapter of your life is like right now, this is not how your story ends. Your story ends the same way the disciples' story ends. Jesus will eventually deliver you from this trying world. And he will take you to the place he has prepared for you. And there you will spend eternity with him. The last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, tell you about the place Jesus has prepared for you. And it might be a good idea for you to read those two chapters and read them soon. But until then, let me give you an idea of what the final chapter of your story will be like. Jesus has prepared a place for you where there will be no more devil. 
I thought I'd get a, yeah, I thought I'd get more of a response there, you know. <laughs> yeah, amen. No more evil. No more sin. No more mistreatment. No more rejection. No more betrayal. No more loneliness. No more slander. No more misunderstandings. There will be no more sorrow. No more fear. No more pain. No more crying. No more death. No more cancer. No more dementia or Alzheimer's. No more pandemics. Come on now. (laughs) No more sickness or disease of any kind. It's a place of indescribable beauty. It's a place where all believers will be reunited. Never to be separated again. And according to my Bible, there's a river there. (laughs) You read my mind. I got a feeling if God put a river there, He intended for us to use it. And I plan on doing a little glorified fishing while I'm there. Best of all, Jesus is there. And we will enjoy Him and we will worship Him forever and ever. I don't know what bad news you may have just received. I I don't know whom you may have recently lost. I don't know what bitter hand life just dealt you. But I do know this. This is not how your story ends. I want you to put yourself in the place of those 11 men who were gathered around Jesus that night. Their hearts were broken and they were scared to death. Can you relate to that? Well, during the very first communion, Jesus made them a promise. And I believe it's the same promise he's making to you today. I want us to read it together. John 16, verse 22. Jesus said, so... You have sorrow now. Boy, I just, you say, Granny, that's, he nailed it. That's got to be a word to me. I, I have sorrow now. But he said, I'll see you again. Then you will rejoice. And no one can rob you of that joy. Hodge translation. This is what Jesus is saying to you. This is not how your story ends. Your sorrow will one day be turned into joy. There are better days ahead. So as we partake in the Lord's Supper today, yes, I want us all to look back and remember everything that Jesus has done for us. But today, I also want us to look ahead to everything that awaits us. Let's pray together. Just take a minute to talk with God. Look back to the cross. Look back to Christ's sufferings, His death. Give thanks for His sacrifice. And how it is translated into your forgiveness and salvation. And actually the, 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 the price that paid for your redemption and your place in heaven. But I want you to look ahead with great anticipation. Understanding that his suffering and his death and his blood purchased you a place in heaven that is coming. And I want you to say, thank you God. 
Thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us, everything you've done for us, everything you will one day do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.